Good evening. I'd like to call our meeting, the school board um, of Latcher County regular business meeting for June 6, 2023 to order. If you all would please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you and welcome to all. We have a pretty packed agenda. We're gonna kind of move through. Um, first up is our ACA um, union updates. And um, I'm gonna give Ms. Tess, Dr. Tessman and Ms. Ward a space to come um, in our first meeting of the month to greet us. And ladies, unfortunately, I am gonna kind of stick to a time, you know, because of the length of our agenda. Thank you. Chair Certain, I'm sorry. Chair Certain, board members, um, Mr. Andrew, and district staff. Um, I'm Dr. Crystal Tessman from the Alachua County Education Association, and I'm service unit director and instructional vice president. Um, my statements will be pretty brief tonight. Um, thank you again for having us and giving us space to speak. Um, my whole reason for speaking tonight is to talk about EDUs. Um, in case anybody hasn't heard already, we have new legislation that's requiring us to stop payroll deduction for union dues. Um, they have only allowed that to stay for police officers, correction, um, firefighters, and EMS, um, but not for educators or electricians and, and the like. So we are having to switch over to e-dues, which is a fully secure, safe, and quick way to have a bank draft from your um, checking account. We have, along with that, we now have to maintain over 60% membership um, of the employee workforce that's eligible for the union to, to maintain our union, which um, maintains our bargaining rights and our contract. Um, and we have pages and pages of contract language that the district has collaborated with us on and commemorated for years to come in writing um, that are rights for our members and for all employees. Um, if we cannot maintain 60% of the workforce, um, that goes away and so does our right to negotiate salaries. Currently, we have 66% of our employees are in the union, which is great. 56% of our members have signed up for e-dues. All those numbers are great. They seem really close to 60, but when you look at the percentage of our members signed up for e-dues that are the percentage of the workforce, we are only at 36%. That is a dangerous number. We still have 840 people we need to sign up for e-dues or we stand to lose our union. Um, if you are a union member, and you are not signed up, please sign up today. Call us tomorrow, 352-377-7635. If somehow we have missed contacting you with your link. Um, and if you have a friend um, who's not in eDues yet, please ask them to sign up. We only need everybody to sign up one person and we'll be, we'll be good. Thank you, Dr. Chessman, and um, thank you, board chair and board members, and thank you to the superintendent and district staff for um, hearing us. I do wanna say not every worker can be in a union, but every worker benefits from unions that negotiate rights for workers. And so there are many members that have not participated in their union up until this point, and they thought the union would always be there for them. And that is not a stable fact at this point, and that is why we're, see we're, we're seeking injunctive relief. We are in a lawsuit. Um, a, it's actually against the Public Employee Relations Commission to battle this and to put a stop to what the law says that we cannot collect dues. So that is going on as well. June 23rd is the hearing on that, but I wanna get on to honoring 
our amazing members because we have a lot of retirees and we are going to have a celebration for ACA retirees and that is going to be June 28th at 6 o'clock. It's going to be at Kanapaha Botanical Garden Spring House and we are, we are going to be um, celebrating a long, long history of um, education there. So that's very exciting. So for the class of 2023, so that's the new retirees, and there are a lot of them. We also have um, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas scholarship that we give out every year to graduating seniors because I want to remind everyone that union members are mostly parents. So we have three seniors that have received our Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Do Good Scholarship that ACA um, awards each year. Claire Rochford from Gainesville High School who is the daughter of Megan Rochford. Amelia Francis from Gainesville High School who's the daughter of Michelle Francis. Naya Jobson, daughter of member Binta Munker, from, she's from Buholtz High School. And from Buholtz High School, our member Jennifer Presley received our scholarship. And she is, currently works with students with disabilities as a paraprofessional. And she is returning to um, in, increase her education and become an ele uh, early elementary um, educator. So we were really um, excited to give those scholarships. And thank you for giving us this time. Um, thank you, Dr. Tessman and Ms. Ward for bringing those updates to um, the board as well as your membership about what's happening in ACA. And uh, like you, I extend our congratulations to the scholarship winners as well as thank my thanks and appreciation to the employees who um, have recently retired or will retire at the end of this, this fiscal year, school year. Thank you for that. So now, we have, before we adopt our agenda, I want to fill in everyone on a few changes that we're going to make to the agenda, um, if we could. So um, Ms. Green gave us some updated materials, but the, there are a few things. On consent uh, agenda item three, there was one item that was listed on there to Harvard um, Jolly for $1,300,000. $30,270. That's been removed. That was incorrectly listed there. So I'm not pulling the item. We're just letting you all know that that's been corrected. And Ms. Green gave out a revised copy of that. Um, and then in the public hearing section, the adoption of the instructional materials for, for social studies it has been moved from action item up to um, public hearing item number three. And then under action items, employee case number two um, will, has been pulled, that employee resigned. And action item number six, which is the change order for Westwood, it's going to now become action item number one, and everything else will just be renumbered down. So I'm going to move that over the change order um, for Westwood that Actually, it's currently action item number six in your printed agenda. That will now become action item number one. Um, and then um, the rezoning update, action item number eight is going to be pulled. So those are the changes um, that I have. Does anyone else have anything on the consent agenda that they would like to pull or any other changes or modifications to the agenda? Seeing none, can I get a motion to approve the modified agenda? So moved. Thank you. Motion by Dr. Rockwell, second by um, Dr. McNeely. Is there any discussion? Um, on the adoption of the agenda or on the items that were going to come? The items. And okay. The All right. So let's, we, let's adopt the agenda, and then when we get to them, you can, we can come to those. Okay. So if there's, um, is there any public input or... Anything? Okay. Seeing none, um, all in favor of adopting the agenda as modified? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes 5-0. Okay. 
All right, so the first thing on our agenda is the uh, approval of the school board minutes, minutes from school board meeting from May 16th. So moved, Madam Chair. So thank you. Motion by Dr. Ms. McGraw, is there a second? Second, second by um, Dr. Rockwell. Is there any discussion from the board? Any public input? Anyone on the phones? Okay, thank you. All in favor of adopting the uh, May, minutes from May 16th? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes 5 0. Um, next, we have board member and superintendent announcements. And when I recognize you, if you would please turn your light off. Okay. Um, Mrs. McGraw, you're recognized. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening to each of you, and thank you for attending. Uh, just a couple of recognitions. Uh, attended the VPK middle and high school graduations. They were all wonderful. I really enjoyed the speeches and seeing the talent displayed of our students and to our staff and our teachers and administrators. They did a great job with those um, graduations. Uh, I do want to say thank you to Ms. Uh, Neves, Ms. Richardson, and Ms. Diamond for all of their hard work with the VPK graduation, something I you know, truly monitored this past year. And I have to give a shout out to Ms. Pauline Smith. She is the VPK teacher at Wiles, and she has 18 out of 20 of her students who are proficient. They are ready for kindergarten and that's what we want to see and like to see them be tracked all the way up to third grade to see how they're doing starting at VPK but hats off uh, to Miss Pauline Smith excellent excellent just as well as our other teachers but I know the parents I got a chance to witness parents crying because they were hating VPK is VPK is over and they have to transition the other thing is want to thank you to uh, Mr. Andrew and the principal of turnaround thank you for implementing that I want to give a shout out to Ms. Roll and Ms. Leinenbach. They did a great job. Principals are really thankful for that extra support this year, and they were able to see some movement toward our gap. We're not there, but they were able, with that principal turnaround and extra, extra support being put in this year, uh, everybody's talking about that is help, helpful. We still have a long way to go, but I think it's important for you as the community to know we are making some progress, and I'm a very optimistic person, so I want to move forward with sharing what we are trying to do well. And again, Ms. Jones, we know that your soon-to-be retirement is on its way. I really enjoyed her retirement party to hear uh, the stories and to hear people who have worked with you over the years. So again, congratulations on your retirement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Ms. McGraw, would you turn your light off? Um, Dr. McNeely, I don't see your light before I go to Mr. Andrew, but uh, do you have anything? I know you normally do, so you don't have to turn your light on. I just, before I went to Mr. Andrew, I wanted to recognize you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, I, too, want to thank and congratulate all of our students who finished a full year. Oh, wow. And I know you are still probably celebrating because of that. But um, to all of our students who were promoted as well, not just the graduates, but the students who were promoted, you worked hard. You did everything that you were capable, hopefully, of doing. And we expect you to get some rest. Some of you are attending our summer program. And we look forward to seeing the results of those actions as well. But if you're traveling abroad or um, right to Micanope, we just hope that you have a very good time this summer. And we look forward to seeing you again on August the 10th, 2023. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dr. McNeely. And like my colleagues, we had a full week there leading up to graduations. Um, it's always, graduations at any level is uh, one of the highlights uh, for me of being a board member. You get to share in the joy of the students and their families as they've progressed along, you know, um, from if some of them have been with us since Head Start or 
long years ago um, up until now at 12th grade, but no matter when they start or whatever, high school graduations are just that, that period of one, one chapter ending and they're starting and transitions to another. So like my colleagues, we, um, I enjoy, enjoyed uh, that, and I want to congratulate those the students and families that are, are embarking upon, be it a promotion, advancement to the next level, or those who are entering the workforce and those who may be um, continuing their post-secondary experience. And um, so that is what I have there. I had a question I wanted to ask Mr. Andrew for something that I wasn't aware that was even being considered, but I got a text that says that, oh, I didn't know y'all were moving the fire program to um, to Newberry High School, so please do, um, Mr. Andrew, fill that in with us because the Board of County Commissioners made that announcement, and I was caught a little flat-footed with that, so, and not knowing that, that the, the fire magnet or CT program is moving from Lofton to Newberry High. That appeared in an email today, right? Oh, I don't know where it came. I got a phone. I got a text about it, so I don't know. I, I'm like, I didn't know that, so. I'd have to get clarification from Shannon Ritter on that because that's not anything that we, I don't see that magnet being moved right at this time to criminal justice, so. It's just a rumor. Mrs. Wise, did you have any information on that? No, sir, I had not heard that. Um, there's been some discussion about uh, exploring offering a course in 911 operator at Newberry High School, but I am not aware of the fire program being moved, but I'll see if I can get information before the end of the meeting. Right. I think there's some um, miscommunication on the wording of that because the fire program is at Lofton, but it could be an extension of the operator program, 911 operators. So we'll get clarification for you. Madam Chair, may I move forward with my move announcements? Forward. So we just want to congratulate uh, Weston Martin from Lincoln Middle School. As many of you know, he made it to the semifinals in the Scripps B Spelling B competition. He was uh, one of just 56 that made it to those semifinals. So um, hands down, he's made it farther than any ACPS student ever. And so we want to Certainly congratulate them, let them know we're awful proud of them, and just way to go, Weston. And then also I'd like to extend congratulations to Mrs. Vita Jackson-Carter as director of the ACPS Students to Successful Citizens System of Care Program. She was recognized as one of four women who make a difference. Uh, she was one of the honorees, uh, and she was recently recognized for being an outstanding role model for girls and representing Girl Scout values. And of course, as has been mentioned, we just want to thank all of our Alachua County Public School employees and students who worked so hard this school year. We completed the school year last Wednesday, as you know, May 31st. And as has been mentioned by our school board members, we attended many, many, many graduations and promotion ceremonies. They were all a joy to attend, certainly as um, Mrs. Certain mentioned is it's the highlight of the school year, right? When we can see the culmination of our hard work. So again, congratulations to the class of 2023 and best wishes to them. All right, thank you, Mr. Andrew. Thank you for turning off your light there. All right. We are moving right along. We are now at our first citizen input. We have 15 minutes that we're allowed for citizen input at the beginning of our meeting for items that are not on the agenda. Um, I have one form here from for that's been submitted, but if you'd like to comment during this time, you can um, get up and queue up. So the form that I have is from Billy Taggart. And if you go to the lectern and give us your name, and you'll have three minutes from the, with the board. You may have to go there. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Billy Taggart. Uh, I am the director for the Tech Trek program for the uh, Gainesville branch of AAUW. Every year, Florida AAUW holds two camps at two different 
university campuses. This year it's uh, Stetson and um, North, uh, excuse me, well, Florida Atlantic, sorry. <laughs> uh, and uh, these are, this cap is for seventh grade girls going into eighth grade. It's one week, uh, one camp is next week, and the other camp is the week after, so. Uh, the girls are nominated by their science and math teachers. Uh, the, it doesn't cost them anything. Uh, the different branches of AAUW throughout Florida pays the tuition for the girls to attend the camp. We had one applicant this year, one nominee, one applicant, and she was accepted by the Florida um, board. Um, what I would like to do is to make sure that the information about this opportunity for seventh grade girls is disseminated. Uh, I would be willing to go to each of the middle schools during your planning period, the days, planning days, and talk to the head of the math and science department. It would take about 30 minutes of their time, and I could do like two to three uh, schools a day, depending on you know where they are and so forth. Uh, and I, if I re remember correctly, you have a dozen middle schools, is that correct? Just under that, yeah, just yeah. under, not quite that many. So that's, that's why I'm here. I, uh, to, to let you know about the program, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for the girls. They get to stay on a university campus in a dormitory for a week. They get to pick their what subjects they want to study. Uh, they get to meet with professional women in, in uh, science, math, technology, and one night, they go to, they get all dressed up in their business attire and go to a nice sit-down dinner. Uh, I would like to see more girls being accepted and being nominated and going through the process and being accepted for this program. So, Ms. Taggart, I think we might have, be maybe more efficient if we get your, I'll give your contact info to Ms. Johnson and it, this may be a good candidate for us to disseminate the information through our distribution. It's called Peach Jar, right? We have a liaison. Okay. We, we work th with the liaison at Alachua County. Okay. And this year, I, this is my first year with the program. Um, and this year I worked with Dr. Sauber. Okay, I don't, that person? Science. science, okay. So I was wondering if it would be the, the district science person and then we could get the information to the students. We have a system that we're, um, all, we can disseminate information targeted to um, students that, and through our Skyward system and this peach jar thing. And so it may be um, Mr. Akins, we can get him hooked up and maybe next year that would be a, another venue where we could get information to the students. So that would be more. And then you work with the science, um, the district science staff person where we could connect with more students as well. Excellent program you know, to expose our um, young women to science and technology at an early age and so they can, as they're starting career exploration. So thank you all for your, your work in our community. Thank you, and thank, thank you for listening. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Um, I, um, right now we have, I have, I made one omission. I did not add the, when we adopted the agenda, the one meal presentation, it's not there. Can I add that now, Mr. Delaney? We go back and we just do that and we'll make that um, item number eight um, after the ABC report. Is it there? Oh, you know what? So I printed, my, my agenda doesn't, um, is before that. So I had already written notes on it, so we're good. Okay, she gave us an, an update on that. So I, I printed mine before you did that. I printed it um, last night late <laughs> and I had already written notes on it. Okay, good. I think that's the only thing, but go ahead and bring it. Go ahead and bring it, yeah. All right, um, Mr. Gilfillan, are you going to do our presentation for the ABC report? Okay. 
Oh, I'm sorry. Let me call for that. Are, are there any other citizen input forms that I've received? I don't have any other forms. Is there anyone in the auditorium that like to do citizen input? We have anyone on the phone, Mr. Foote? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to go ahead and start. Uh, Mr. Gilfone, we have the public hearing at 630. Um, do you, so you may be able to cue this up, I don't know, and then we'll have to stop because the, the public hearing is time sensitive, time certain, I mean. They changed the order. All right. I'm confident I can give you a, a four-minute version. I don't know if it's, it's the four-minute version you want to hear, but I can do my best. But it, would you like me to? I mean, I can say probably the most important things up front, and then we can okay, go ahead. come back to if we need to. So um, good evening, everyone. My name is Taylor Gilfillan, Director of Data Analytics Evaluation and Accountability. Um, what we have for you tonight, basically, and it's, it's online as well, is an update to our ABC scorecard. Um, lots of things I wanted to say and some, I was gonna make a really great analogy about like GPS and stuff, but um, the most important stuff that I think we're all here for that we wanna jump to really quickly is what's included for the updates for our core academics. So just a really quick uh, recap in terms of what data we have available for us right now. Um, we have our fast progress monitoring three data. Um, that's all of the testing that our kids did in May. Um, K2 is available. Uh, it's not ready and available tonight for us to view. Um, it's reported through a separate platform and it's a little bit more difficult to work with, so it is coming, but um, the focus of what's included tonight is uh, three through 10, um, as well as algebra one and geometry. Um, just some like quick things that I want everyone to know before we start looking at this is this data is preliminary. And what I mean by preliminary is that schools are still finalizing the rosters for their school grades. Um, not because of anything we did or schools did, but because of delay in the process for the Florida Department of Education. Um, a process they usually start and have done by the end of May didn't start until about May 16th. Um, so just as the data you have in front of us, know that there's gonna be some slight changes to it just as we finalize those rosters in accordance with our uh, state's accountability rules. Um, EOC results right now also include retesters. That's a snapshot of just like how kids did in those courses. Again, for school grades, those retesters are not included for each year's school grade purposes. So again, I share this all to say, just as you're looking at it, please be aware of the context um, that it is preliminary. Um, we've never been positioned in like the history of state testing in Florida to like have these results. It's, it's June 6th, like this is fantastic. And this data most importantly is in the hand of teachers and principals who are working with our students at ESY and our summer programs. But um, just know what's being reported. It's what we have available. Um, it's pretty close to accurate, but there will be some slight changes as we um, finalize this process with our schools and our principals. Um, just the last three things, and I think I can do it here leading up until 6.30. Um, you're gonna see three things in there for core academics. We have some state versus district trends already. It's only at the subject and grade level. That's how it's reported to us. We can't drill down and see anything further than that. Um, we'll also see some growth trends by school. Um, we've got some pretty little lines that show just how schools grew in each subject for the year. Um, we'll be coming more with um, some more of the numbers. You can actually see the actual percentages there. Um, and then we also have results that are disaggregated by school and grade level, race and ethnicity, um, students who are English language learners, and our students with disabilities. Um, so that's also all included there in terms of results by different groups. And that is 6.30. Chair Certain, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Goodfellow. We'll call you back, okay? How about that? If need be, okay. Hold on, um, since we have the public hearing here. So we have our policy amendments um, in the 5500 block. Um, Ms. Black, you're beside those. Mr. Andrew, on May 16th, we had the first reading of revisions to amendments to policy 5500 student conduct and amendments to the 2023 
2024 elementary code of student conduct and 2023 2024 secondary code of conduct tonight is a public hearing there were some changes made which you should have in your packet related to input from the board at may 16th and so tonight is the time to hear from the public any revisions they would like to see um miss miss black would you stay there i have a question and i have um, i may need to direct this to to mr delaney as well for some guidance on this um after reading this from the may the May meeting <laughs> um, on for the prime in the primary book as a section as well as the secondary. But since primary is there, page nine, I, I have some concerns about the students who video record a fight um, contribute. And there's a comma there, I think, contribute to causing a disruption in connection with that. I, the problem I have is with the video and I'm not saying we I'm wanting kids to go around and video. But what I am saying is that if someone videos, um, because of the era in which we live and how um, George Floyd and other incidents that have been caught and there's value to that, I'm having, I'm, I've been struggling with this for a couple weeks and I forgot to mention this when we talked earlier today. Um, I'm struggling with having this in here as this stands as saying someone video in a fight would be in violation of the code of student conduct that that and i hear what you're saying and i can tell you the committee discussed some of the same things because sometimes that's valuable information for both the school administration and for law enforcement when they're proceeding with an investigation their concern had to do with the idea of individuals gathering to video and at the same time encouraging the fight so that's how that found itself as a recommendation from the discipline committee. But certainly I defer to Mr. Delaney if we can adjust some of that language to make it clearer. Yeah, do you have any suggestions, Mr. Delaney? Because that, as it writes right now, students who video a fight, comma, contribute to causing a disruption in connection with the fight, you know, and then so on. To me, it's reading as if just video in a fight, you'd be in violation of the code of student conduct and could get punished for that. I think that aligns with what our policy is that students are allowed to have their cell phone with them during the due, during the school day, that's state statute, but they are not allowed to have it out without specific teacher authorization uh, and bringing out a cell phone to videotape a fight doesn't fall in that category. So that's a violation of the student code of conduct right there. Um, I can't speak for specific instances in Alachua County, but the trend of the discussion is that across the state is that um, fights have been staged for the specific purpose of videotaping them. Um, uh, students can, who may be on the receiving end or losing end of a fight can have sort of that humiliation perpetuated by having that um, be put on social media. Um, so I think our principals and our staff have put together this plan that aligns with what our policy currently is, which are phones are not to be out during the day without teacher permission for an instructional purpose. And then secondly, um, to limit the, the fallout and sort of the perpetuation of these fights. And I think that's why it was put together in that manner. Um, I see um, Ms. McGraw's light, and if you, is, is that on this subject right here? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. In that same section, um, and I agree with everything uh, Mr. Delaney has said because that, that's been a huge problem. Uh, but we talk about consequences, and so I'm seeing in here, Ms. Black, about subject to disciplinary consequences, but I still would like to know what those consequences would truly look like. And I think there is not a exact answer to that. I think when we look at the whole of what happens through the investigation, they're looking at the age of students, the disciplinary history of students, uh, the remorse of a student, all of the factors that we find in our code of conduct would then determine whether or not it is a, um, what level an administrator would determine it to be, 
whether it is something that could lead to an out-of-school suspension or something that would be perhaps, um, you know, parent conference. I think it will vary because it depends on the intensity of what's going on. Yeah, and, and I, I hear what you're saying. I just want to make sure we, we're trying to change behavior. So I want to make sure we're consistent. So whatever we're doing, because uh, when we start getting into a lot of discretionary things, we just want to make sure we're being consistent across the board from school to school when these things are happening. So hopefully before the next reading, maybe you all can have a little bit more uh, discussion regarding that. Thank you, ma'am. Dr. Rockwell. Um, I think my question is um, more for Mr. Delaney. Um, on the previous page eight, um, under weapons, we're using um, Florida statute 790, mm -hmm. um, but there are also Board of Education, like Department of Education rules that define weapons and the two don't match. And I'm wondering which takes precedent here. Well, um, Florida statute takes precedence over Board of Education rules, um, but we would want to be um, applying both of those as long as they're not in conflict with each other. So it looked like to me when I read them, and I'm not a lawyer, and so that's why I'm deferring to you, it, it appeared to me that the statute has a broader definition and the Board of Education rules was slightly narrower. Yes, ma'am, I, I see where you're coming with that. The, part of the issue is that uh, th there's an intent to encompass any item that's used as a weapon, um, and you can't identify every single object that that may be appropriate for the school setting, but if it's misused, it, it could be used as a weapon. So there's an intent to capture that, and if we need to work on this language, but the, our policies would need to implement both state statute and approved Department of Education regulations. Both are reference, right? Both, both the statute and, well, the state statute is and when you go to um, the Board of Education, it lists 790 and then a 1006 something statute in there, because I went and looked as well. Both of them are listed. Um, okay. Madam Chair, I had one other question. I'm yes, sorry. go ahead, Mom, Ms. McGraw. Um, the other thing is, other the consequences, Ms. Black, I think for possession and distribution or sales of vaping devices, I uh, wanted to know the rationale. I see the first offense and the second offense are the same. I was just trying to see what the committee, on page 11, on what, uh, what the committee um, discussed about that. The discussion uh, evolved around whether or not we had a student who had a an addiction right. to something. And so initially in the first and second offense, the idea was to do some educational purposes and to do some support before you got to um, significant consequences. Okay, so counseling and possibly meeting with the parent is included. That's what I want to make sure. Right. Okay. Thank you. You know, I was going to um, bring for the tobacco free um, some stuff that they're doing like in other districts. It's a lot of educational programs that may be good since we noticed this vaping and smoking seems to be so um, prevalent. Um, Dr. Ruckwell, your light's still on, Ms. McGraw, yours is on still. Right, do you have another question or something? Okay. Um, I had one other question. Um, on page 15, consequences of violation for of bus rules. Um, I know we discussed why we wanted the bus drivers to have the authority of a classroom teacher and be able to write referrals. I just wanted to make sure with Mr. Delaney that this was um, okay based on the bus driver's contracts and st state statute and board of education rules. I, I'm not aware of any reason why this would not be uh, in compliance with those. Anyone else have any questions, any input? Is there any, Mr. Jones, I see you standing there. Do you have something you'd like to bring forth? Actually, turn your mic on, please, sir. Yeah, there, it's on now. 
Good after, uh, afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Board, and Superintendent Andrew. Uh, as you know, discipline is an issue, especially on school buses when you have a school bus driver. Uh, they don't have a resource officer. They don't have an assistant principal there. They don't have a dean, a BRT. Uh, they are out there by themselves. So we just wanted to give some teeth uh, to the discipline of students on the bus. There are some wild things going on on the bus. Uh, we want to stop those things. They're unsafe. Uh, students should be able to ride to school in a safe environment. Uh, you should not be videotaped. Uh, for example, I witnessed a video of a student, uh, an aggressive student jumped on another student and other students were videotaping it. And you have that video for the rest of your life. Uh, and that student was assaulted on the bus. And we want to stop those things. Students who are being aggressive, who are being violent on the bus, who are vaping on the bus, we need to take those students off the bus. Uh, they may get back on the bus, uh, but they need to go, come off the bus. We have to give some teeth to discipline on the school bus as well as in the classroom, of course. Uh, but we just want to make sure students are able to ride to school in a safe environment. Um, I agree with you, Mr. Jones. I did notice the suspension is taking place after the third refer referral. Um, and it looks like the fourth seven day extent, um, suspension. So it looks like you all are like tightening up instead of it being so yes. and taking so long to do that. Um, it'll just have to be like a consistency from bus to bus with infractions, right, from the drivers. So, um, but uh, Actually from the school. Uh, we can have all the rules in place. If we don't back it up, and do something about it, it doesn't mean anything. We have to put some teeth behind it. Uh, again, we want all kids to ride the bus. We're not trying to put any kids off the bus. But again, we have to have it where it's an orderly environment, just a, like a classroom. Just like a bus, a classroom teacher, a bus driver, is, it has that. that's their classroom. And we want to make it a safe environment. I've seen students cursing out bus drivers, uh, saying all type of stuff to each other. And we can't have just a wild environment on the bus. And that's one of the reasons that some of our bus drivers don't want to be bus drivers uh, and bus attendants is because of the kids behavior on the bus. And once we, honestly, I'm going to be honest, once we put one or two off, everybody will get the message that we're not playing and uh, that we got some rules on the bus. And again, we're not trying to target anybody. We're not, we want everyone to ride the bus to school and home in a safe and orderly fashion. But students who are being aggressive, who are vaping, who are being uh, out of control on the bus, right then, they may be able to ride the bus in the future, but right now they may not be able to ride the bus. I, I, we, I think the board, this board supports the actions that you're taking you um, to support the drivers and the aides to create a safe work and riding environment for the drivers as well as the students. So whatever we you know, we're, we're supporting the, the actions and the, the changes in this code of student conduct to create that environment for you all. So you, you mentioned that it's with you all in the school. So I'm hoping that that conversation is had be between yourself and the building administrators or whatever it needs to do so that you all will have the support you need to create that safe environment. Thank you. Um, to my colleagues, y'all have anything else on this right here before we move forward with that? Okay. So I think we, we need a motion to move forward with this in the, I'm sorry, public, the public, the public, public hearing, any public input on this particular, on the code of student conduct for primary or secondary? Any phone calls, Mr. Foote? No phone calls? Okay. And Mr. Delaney, if I'm correct, we do have to vote on this to move forward, correct? Or are we just receiving public input and just going forward? We, we're, we're just receiving public all input. Right. All righty. Thank you, Ms. Black, and thank you to my colleagues for that. Um, Mr. Shelnut's at the lectern for the next group. Uh, good evening, Chair Certain, members of the board, Superintendent Andrew. Uh, the next item for public hearing are proposed amendments to board policies 1215, 3215, and 4215. These are uh, um, changes as a result of Neola's work with the Department of Health, really better rewriting our tobacco-free policies and providing some additional clarifications. And just as uh, Ms. Black said, and, and you did as well, Madam Chair, this is an opportunity for any members of the board, any members of the public uh, to put forth any uh, perspectives that they may have on these proposed revisions. Okay. So 
I didn't have any. I looked at a couple other districts, and this is bringing us up to what they have since we're all, all the other NEOLA districts here. Uh, do my colleagues have any feedback or any input on these policies? Mr. Foote, you have any phone calls for? Anyone in the public wish to comment on um, these policy changes to our tobacco-free um, policies? If you do, you can go now. My colleagues down on this end to my right, I don't think I look down there. All right. All right thank you, Mr. Shelna. All right. The next section is Ms. Wise and Ms. and Dr. Edwards. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board Members, Superintendent Andrew. Uh, we are bringing back before you this evening for public comment one policy in the 2000s, six policies in the 5000s, and three in the 3000s for any further comment or input. Give me just a minute. Let me see if I have any posters in that section. I did want to ask, like, we're adopting this now, but this will change again, right, as, as a result of this last session here. That was the one note that I had in there. So we're... Yes. Yes, ma'am, uh, and I think we knew that uh, the NEOLA updates were coming, but we were in, I think we said that the first time when Dr. Edwards and I presented and we were still in legislative session. So we will probably be bringing some of these back again. Okay. To, um, Dr. Rockwell, go ahead, you're recognized. Um, so I noticed in policy um, 5350, that um, in other policies, we have definitions of parents to include guardians. This policy doesn't specifically define it, um, but says parents, and I wasn't sure if we needed to have that defined in this policy, or if it's, this is more of a Mr. Delaney question, or if it's sufficient that it's, that parents is defined in other policies. I think that um, we would still be able to uh, interface with guardians even if it doesn't say the word guardians here. I, I don't think we have to say parents and guardians every time we're referring to the person who's got authority over the student. All right, thank you. Any any other input from this, from Dr. McNeely, Ms. Haber? Okay. Any public input on this particular set of policies here? Um, any phone calls? All right, we'll move to the next section, which are the finance sections. Mr. Burkett. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, there are two policies in the 6,000 area that are up for public hearing tonight. Um, first one is 6310. Mr. Mr. Burkett, I'm sorry, would you move your mic closer to you? Um, yes, ma'am, I'm sorry. You, you can pick it up just so you don't have to lean over. Just pick it up and put it a little bit closer to you so we can hear you. There, there are two policies in the 6,000 area that uh, are up for public hearing tonight. The first one is 6210, which provides some clarification language uh, regarding fund balances, maintaining fund balance, how they're classified, which complies with GASB 64. Um, it sets some uh, ceiling limits on uh, revenue estimates uh, by the superintendent. Otherwise, it's fairly just some minor changes in that policy. Uh, 6325 is uh, procurement of federal grants. It was came as a suggestion from the Florida Department of Agriculture uh, regarding non-domestic purchase of agriculture products and uh, also establishing that all bids are open in public, but pretty minor language. Okay. Thank you. Um, so for me, I'll, I'll, I'll let my colleagues go. You all have anything on this? On the, Okay, Dr. Rock will go ahead. I, it wasn't this. It wasn't this one, I missed one in the previous group. Is it okay if I go back and ask it a question? Um, let us finish this one since okay. he just set this one up and then we'll go back to that one, okay? All right. All right. So for policy 6210, I do not feel comfortable with taking out the, the percentage there that's sealing the 4% of annual resources. I think the 3% should stay in as well. And it, at a minimum, the 3%, if we don't have the 4% seal in it, that's there, um, especially in this time of where we are in our funding, I think it needs to be very, very clear that the fund balance is 3% by law, 
Um, and that needs to, I, I think it should stay in our fiscal plan, in, in this policy. It's in another place, but I think, I, I, I feel pretty strongly that we should keep that there, not take it out. And I looked at two other counties to, from our colleagues. I always go and look at Leon because I feel, to me, they're like our little sister county in a sense, a lot like us, um, and Leon has the three and four percent. They have the policy as we've had, and then I looked at um, Charlotte County. They have the same, the three and the four percent. Um, Citrus has just one percentage in at three and a half percent. So, um, for me, we and, and our policy that this is updating had three percent as a ceiling, and in the four percent of our, so at a minimum, I think we should leave. Um, the three percent in if we take the four out. So I'm not sure. Um, how, what's your reading on that? Who who said that? Sorry. Okay. I'm not sure. What what does that mean? I'm sorry. So I, it, you said you take a look at it. I'm trying to figure no, out no, like no, this policy. I guess what they were trying to do was align this policy with our budget policy. I know when the policy gets down to 5%, we have to, uh, the fund balance gets down to 5%, we have to write a plan 3% as a state law. And uh, I don't think it's a problem leaving the 4% or 3% in this policy. But. Yeah, like I said, I think if we take the 4% out, that would make, um, it make it clearer because I have asked, like, why do we have 3, 4, and 5, right? So 5% fund balance is board policy. 3% is the law, and I think just having the, leaving the three in there, just if someone doesn't know that that's the law. Like when I first came on the board, I didn't know that was the law. I had to read the policy, read the statute to figure out that that was the law. Um, so I think for clarity and just so for some, the new person, a new board member, whoever it comes to know that, or the public to read, so we, they don't have to go to the statute. So I think at a minimum, I think we should have the 3% if we are, are gonna take away the four, um, for the unreserved um, annual revenues in there, take that out because that was a little conflicting. But I, I, I think leaving the three in is, is really key for me. So I'm not sure how my, my colleagues feel about it, but I, I think the three should be there. So, okay. Any comment on this end? Okay. All right. Is there any public input? Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Ward, you can go to the mic, please. I just have to rise in support of maintaining the accurate information um, of 3% is the required fund balance. Um, I disagree strongly with the board policy of 5% budget because I think the responsible way to go in a school district is to spend as much of the money on the students and the employees as you possibly can. And that is defined in the Florida law as 3%. Thanks. We'll talk, Ms. Ward. <laughs> um, is there any other public input? Okay. All right. So I'm um, sorry, Dr. Rockwell, go ahead. So I'm sorry, this goes back. Um, to the parent responsibility 8620. Um, and I had mentioned this at a previous, I believe it was a workshop, um, where it says if the parent fails to meet the student at the designated bus stop, it has an exemption given for an older sibling taking responsibility, but not a designee of the parent, such as a babysitter or someone else. And that concerns me that that is not in the policy. Uh, yes, ma'am, I'd have to defer and ask Mr. Jones if the parent is able to make another adult designee be the one who can pick up a child at the bus stop. Uh, yes, they are. Uh, right now our policy says uh, kindergartners have to have someone at the bus stop to pick them up. Uh, but. If the administrator at the school uh, deems it appropriate and gives them a letter that they can give to the bus driver, uh, it's fine. You can do it for up, for up to five days. Another adult, you mean, other than the parent? Correct. But well, we've had grandparents and different other uh, people picking up the kids, but they need that letter. 
So, but only for five days. So if a child has a babysitter who picks, who meets them at the bus every day, all year, every week, they have to. I believe the policy, our handbook says five days, but we've, we went past the five days. Yeah, I mean, I think if we have policies and handbooks, we need to follow them. And if they don't work in reality, then we need to revise them so that they work. Correct. We can do that. I think um, we need to look into that process further. We have to be really certain that when we have other persons at our stops picking up our children, that we've had opportunities to clear that those are individuals who, in fact, should be taking the kids. Um, and so when those letters are coming, how they're coming, how schools are able to actually verify that the parents um, have provided, that would be important. So I think we would have to go back and to look at that process and make sure that it's clarified but aligns also with our other policies and the procedures that we're following at schools um, when we are making determinations as to who can pick children up. Attorney Zillian, you go ahead. If I may, Mr. Yes. Chair, um, the other thing to keep in mind is that by Florida statute, by the Florida Administrative Code, by court rulings over the last 30 years, um, the school district's responsibility ends with the student exiting the bus, okay? So we have developed a policy to be above that bare minimum level that we're required by statute, um, but there is a direct handoff of a responsibility when the student leaves our care, our supervision on the bus, and, and the parents are required to take over and be responsible once the student leaves our bus. Now we have some other policies for our youngest students to kind of build some safety measures in on that, um, but legally we all need to be aware that the, the parents have to be ready to exercise their responsibility for those students when they leave the bus in our supervision. Yes, sir. Next bunch. Good evening, Madam Chair. Um, this public hearing is for two policies in the 7,074.34, which um, addresses tobacco-free environment, and 7440.01, um, which addresses video surveillance and electronic monitoring. Any public input? Oh, I'm sorry. Any of um, anyone have any? Uh, my colleagues have any input on these policies? Okay. Any phone calls, Mr. Foot? Okay, anyone in the audience have any input on these policies here? Okay, Amen. thank you, sir. All right. Ms. Wise. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have uh, for public hearing this evening um, the list of social studies textbooks, instructional materials. Uh, that we are bringing to the public and to the board for comment. Uh, this is the slate of state approved um, textbook adoption committee selected text for our core social studies courses in K uh, through 12th grade. And um, we will be bringing these back to you. This is our first opportunity to hear public input on the final slate of books selected for adoption. Um, I was wondering whether we are adopting new social studies textbooks for the AP courses as well. So that's a great question. We adopt uh, AP course materials during the cycle if the AP tests have changed. So if the uh, outside of just regular replacement materials, but a new text wouldn't be adopted for AP courses unless uh, the course materials and the AP exam had changed. All right. They aren't necessarily on the state of Florida textbook adoption cycle. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions um, before we go to public input? Okay. Any phone calls, Mr. Foot? Anyone in the audience? Have any input on the social studies textbook adoption? All right, seeing none, we move that along. I think that was the last. Yes, that was the last public hearing. Okay. All right. So we're going to um, go back to um, 
our agenda. Mr. Gilfillan, I'm gonna, the one mill was before ABC. I'm gonna get her, get Ms. Gallagher and let her come forth with her report and then we'll circle back to you, okay? Thank you, sir, for your flexibility. I'm Debbie Gallagher, and I'm the chair of the One Mill Oversight Committee, and it's a delight to be here today. Uh, my opportunity to come before you and share the kinds of expenditures that have taken place across this last year, the programs that are impacted, and the students, the number of students impacted, and the uh, PowerPoint presentation will actually even show where we've come across the years, which is really pretty powerful. It's, it's good to bring good news before the school board. Uh, first of all, the One Mill, uh, was first approved by the voters, if you recall, in 2008 had some economic problems within the state, and we lost some teacher positions, and the one mill came forward, and it was renewed in 2012 with a 68% um, approval rating, again in 2016 with a 77% approval rating, and then most recently in 2020 with a 79% approval rating, which shows that our community is committed to excellence in education. It makes you very proud. Uh, what this means is for every uh, $1,000 of taxable value of property, we receive $1. And we've raised uh, between, it depends upon the year how property values go, but as little as $11 uh, million to $21.8 million a year going to our programs and to our teachers. And that's pretty powerful. One of the responsibilities of the One Mill Oversight Committee is to ensure that the district uh, spends money on uh, programs that are in the ballot language. And the ballot has changed across time, a little bit across time, but it's important to revisit it and look at it. And it says, shall Alachua County School District's existing one mill ad valorem tax be renewed beginning July 1st, 2021 and ending four years later on June 30th, 2025 for necessary operating expenses to fund school nurses, elementary music and art programs, drama programs, K-12 school library programs, K-12 guidance programs, mill and high school band and chorus programs, Academic, academic career technical magnet programs and update classroom technology. That's quite a bit of uh, the kinds of uh, programs that are uh, supported by one mill. And what's important is in the ballot language it says that we must have an oversight by an independent citizens committee and that's what we come to you to share tonight. Uh, I am the chair, uh, current chair. And we have other volunteers within the community that serves on this committee. We meet, meet twice a year, and then we come before the board and have a, an annual report. I don't see anybody else here, so I'm going to still mention their names. Harvey Budd, Eric Godot, Sam Goforth, Jean Robinson, Adrian Taylor, Albert White, and Janie Williams. We have five responsibilities. The first is to ensure that the expenditures um, we review the expenditures um, each time we meet. We oftentimes seek additional information. Uh, we present an annual report to the school board on the expenditures of that particular annual year. We report to the school superintendent and also to the school board chair any inconsistencies that we see between expenditures and what the actual uh, one mill language on the ballot says, and we develop a final report. Um, and so uh, this is pretty impressive, I think. Since 2009, um, the One Mill has raised um, funds for Alachua County Public Schools to the tune of $195.1 million on all those programs, supporting classroom teachers and impacting students. Um, there are, these are the kinds of uh, impact that happens within teachers. And the first one is on our academic career tech magnet programs, 186 teacher units are funded by one mill. 
School nurses has been on the ballot since the very beginning, but we are funded through Medicaid and Health Department, but we have it on the ballot in case those funds no longer are available. We know the importance of having school nurses, and so we keep it in the, in the um, ballot language. 74 teacher units are funded through elementary art, are funded funding elementary art and music teachers. 22 units fund high school and middle school band and chorus teachers. We have 49 media specialist units that are supported within our school libraries, 55 counselor units, and critically important, we have classroom technology supported in the way of technicians and equipment. So therefore, there are 386 teacher positions, technicians, and technology that's supported with one mil funds. Um, I'm a bottom line person, and coming from the school system, it's all about kids. And so I appreciate the impact that teachers have and programs have, but what does it mean in regards to how many students are impacted by the funding of one mil? And it is every single student in the district because they're impacted by way of guidance counselors or perhaps through media specialists, technology, fine arts, all of those programs, current career and magnet technical programs. And so every single student is impacted by these funds. Um, to say academic magnet programs as a term says something, but when you look at the extent of what we have within this district and the location across the district, it's pretty powerful. We have gifted and talented, talented magnet at Archer, fine arts magnet at Rawlings, STEM program at Stephen Foster, STEAM at Metcalf, gifted magnet at Williams, dual language immersion at Twilliger, academic of technology and gifted studies at Howard Bishop, Lyceum at, at Lincoln, Center for Advanced Academics and Technology at Oakview, Biomedical Mustangs at Mabane, IB at Eastside, Cambridge at Gainesville High School, and you look at the career academies we have across the district, at Buholz, the Academy of Entrepreneurship, the Academy of Finance, Eastside High School, the Institute of Culinary Arts, Gainesville High School, Academy of Health Professions, Academy of Future Teachers, Hawthorne, we have the Academy of Agribusiness, uh, Lofton, Academy of Automotive Technology, Academy of Gaming and Mobile Apps, Academy of Graphic Art and Design, Academy of Fine, Fire and Emergency Medical Services, Academy of Robotics and Engineering, Newberry High School, the Academy of Chris Criminal Justice, and Santa Fe, Academy of Agri-Science and the Institute of Biotechnology. And at this map says it all, we have it all across the district uh, from north, south, and east and west. We have career academies available to our students and they are, in, they are um, powered by one mil funds. Um, when you look at this, it always comes down to also how does it impact students. In Alachua County Public Schools, middle and high school students earn 4,318 career certifications just this past year. Um, in the arts, Alatra County students have access to robust arts programs, including musical, music, visual, and performing arts. Um, and there's research out there that supports the importance of fine arts within the learning of students. It shows that students who uh, learn the arts may help them master other subjects, such as reading, math, social studies. Students who participate in the arts learning experience often improve their achievement in other realms of learning and life. Um, and technology is, as we know, is, is part of how we are, uh, how we support our education through in regards to student access to information, but also teacher teaching. So we have purchased more than 7,000 computers for the classroom, more than 400 interac interactive projectors, district-wide Wi-Fi re refresh, which is critical, instructional software, and up-to-date computer labs in every school. In action, we have three GHS students earn top scores in the nation on Cambridge exams. Three Buhol students earn perfect AP scores. EHS IB diploma pass rate tops international rate. We have Lincoln student is one of 56 semifinalists in the 2023 Spelling Bee. We heard that earlier. Wiles Chorus wins first place in Choral Grand Champion Award at the Music USA Festival. Buhol student named finalist in the U.S. Navy Band Competition. And 39 Alachua County Public School students selected as all-state musicians. 
GHS Chorus was a prestigious Disney World performance. Howard Bishop Middle, Thespians chosen to perform at state conference. 2023 Middle and High School Honor Bands performed for the community and Rawlings Music Program featured in the International Research. Um, and so I wanted to bring that to you because it's really powerful how we're uh, uh, acquiring funds for our district and how we're, uh, we're spending them. But I also want to say thank you to a couple people um, within the school district that have been helpful with our committee. And Jamar is one of those people. He is the community engagement coordinator, and he's the one that gets us all together, keeps us coordinated, uh, makes sure that we have our meeting dates on time and that we know what we're supposed to do at the right time at the right place, and we're appreciative. And also, I do want to say thank you to Alex Rella, who has been the chief financial officer for a number of years. Um, it's his reports that we require that are easy to understand. He answers questions for us. He keeps us in the know of how our monies are being spent and if they're in within the realm of our ballot language. And so much appreciation to him across the years. Um, I thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gallagher, for your report your, and your service on the committee, the Oversight Committee, you as well as your colleagues that are serving on that. Do any of my colleagues have any questions or any comments for Ms. Gallagher? Just want to say thank you, uh, Ms. Galloway, for your for presenting. It was great, and I think it was great for our community uh, to hear. So I'm thanking Madam Chair for that being on the agenda so that we know how, when people know where their money, how their money is doing, they're okay. So thank you again for coming and presenting this evening. All right, thank you. Yeah, um, I'll share with you guys one day the worksheet that I built from the inception of the mill that shows expenditures by school and program. It's pretty interesting, kind of eye-opening, really eye-opening. So the mill does a whole lot, and so it'll be out um, up on the ballot in 2024 um, next year in November. It comes up for renewal, and so that'll take the work of the committee and um, the board and everybody getting out there to get going to, to let the inform the public of the good work, uh, the benefit that the, their tax dollars are um, having on our school district. Yes, Dr. McNeely, I see you. Your light's on. Dr. McNeely, your light's on. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, to Mrs. Gallagher and members of her committee, we are esteemed proud um, to be a part of what you do, what you care about, and it's all for our students. I will be talking with the superintendent about a couple of programs that you listed here in the presentation. All of them are excellent, but I need to see two additional things, and you have the money um, to be robust and um, tough and challenging for our kids. Thank you again for all that you do, and please pass that on to your teammates. Thank you. Anyone else have anything? Okay. All right, we'll go back now to um, our ABC report. See Ms. Ms. Wise and Mr. Gilfillan are there. And, um... All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to pick up from our three-and-a-half-minute version. <laughs> Um, from where we left off. Um, so again, we're in a, just resetting the stage, we, we have the preliminary data that we have in front of us now. Um, the analogy I didn't get to share earlier that I'm really excited to share now, if it gets displayed, there it is, um, is when I think about the ABC scorecard and report, I think about a GPS unit. So if you're getting in your car and you're driving to go somewhere, you need three things. Um, you need to know where you're going, your GPS needs to know where you are now, and that's what allows you to craft and, and, and plot the route to take a left on Main and get where you're going. So when we think about our, our district and the goals that um, we, we set earlier this year around attendance, behavior, and core academics, um, I'm really proud of the work that our team and our district has done around this and helping us really be clear on what that goal, what that destination is, and being really clear on where we are now. Um, and it's our collective responsibility and work as a team to plot that course and drive the car to get there. Um, so when I think of what this report is, I, I think of this, which is helping us understand where we are and ultimately where we want to be. 
In terms of for today, I think I've, I honestly shared, I think the most important updates in terms of, of, of what we have today and what we're looking at. Um, you'll note on the one pager, we have our updates for our attendance and behavior. We'll release probably another one closer to the June 2nd or the June 20th meeting, just because in this window of the year, as we're closing out in Skyward, we're finalizing any of the outstanding attendance or, or um, referrals or anything that's there that we need to dot our T's and cross our I's on. We've seen some month to month shifts on those. So this is as close to as final as we have right now um, in terms of our monthly trends. Um, Again, we anticipate um, K-2 results. Um, K-2 results are not for state accountability um, in, in terms of a school grade. They're now being administered by the state, but there is no plans or indication from the state that they're making that any kind of part of school grades. Um, and we look forward to presenting more and sharing more about what that data is telling us along with our Dibbles data um, the next opportunity we get. Um, I'm happy to take just a couple of quick questions at the end. I'm gonna pass it over to my um, friend and teammate, um, Ms. Wise, who's just gonna tell us a little bit about what some of the data we have. Um, and I'm also just gonna share just a couple of subject specific um, pieces that I think the board needs to understand and our community and public needs to understand. And this is gonna be around middle school math, but I'm gonna turn over to Ms. Wise to say words. Thank you for that and thank you board members for giving us a few minutes this evening and I heard gratitude for our SI principals tonight as I certainly share that and I extend my gratitude to all of our school leaders and our teachers for having a successful school year and our students who were progress monitored three times instead of just once at the end of the year um, on state assessment and I think as we uh, start to disaggregate this data we're we're gonna definitely see areas that we need to continue to target for growth, but I think we're also gonna see some encouraging news and see that things that we're doing are working. I'm reminding everyone that we have new standards and in math this year we had new textbooks. Um, we are working so hard on shoring up our use of core curriculum materials and tier quality tier one instruction and I'm happy to note in some of these graphs as you dig through the report, which is many, many pages, and we won't have time for that this evening, I think that you'll see in almost every elementary assessment that we end up at or very close to the state average, even in those areas, in those um, content areas or grade levels where we began the year much below the state average. And likewise, um, I'm very proud of the work that we've done with secondary ELA in all of our uh, six through 10 state tested ELA areas. We performed above the state average and this was the first year of the use of our uh, secondary literacy implementation specialists and they were able for most of the year to be able to do that um, hands-on job embedded work with our teachers and our curriculum specialists have done such a great job and, and all of our literacy implementation specialists, those elementary literacy implementation specialists were oftentimes um, teaching ELA blocks. And so I'm proud of the work that the team is doing and we know certainly that there's much more of that ahead. So so you do see in the report the, uh, the comparison, just big picture, grade level by content area, how we compare to the state, but then you're also able to dig in a little deeper and see by school and by subject. Um, we will be, we meaning um, uh, the team of smart people that um, Taylor helps to lead, uh, tables with numbers and all sorts of whirly, swirly, wonderful graphic visualizations of this state testing data coming soon. And I know there's been a lot of questions around specifically, this was part of our uh, curriculum goals this year. Our target is that 62% of all students, including all um, ESSA subgroups, will be performing at 62% or higher. And we are not there yet, but you'll be able to start looking at how we did by school, by grade level, in all of these um, subgroups. So I look forward to working more uh, with you and certainly with the teaching and learning division and with our school leaders and with our teachers, but we appreciate this opportunity on a busy board meeting night to put some of this in front of you. Thank you, and I'll just close out with two things, Ms. Certain, and then, and then pass it back over to, to you. Um, 
in our ABC report, I invite you to go to page 33, and I'm going to pull it up here on the slide. <clears throat> Just one thing that I, I want to flag and, and be kind of clear with is when we look at the middle school math, um, we for ELA, if you're in sixth grade, you take the sixth grade ELA fast. If you're in seventh grade, you take the seventh ELA fast. It's not the same with our math courses. So if you look, for example, at the orange and blue lines for sixth, seventh, and eighth math, specifically in that seventh math, you see really wide gaps between what appears to be between the state and Alachua County. This isn't necessarily due to just the seventh graders itself, it's because we have kids testing in different groups. So two examples that I'll share in mind with you, we have about 200 eighth graders across the district who are sixth graders enrolled in seventh accelerated math who are taking eighth grade fast because that seventh grade accelerated math is testing 100% of the eighth grade standards. So this is what we have right now, what I'd like to be able to do in the future for the board and for our curriculum team and the folks who are supporting instruction is break this down by the course level, not necessarily just what tests they took. Because um, again, we have a lot of our seventh graders who are taking seventh grade accelerated math and are actually showing up in that eighth grade math. So. This is how it's reported. I'd ask you just like to not jump to conclusions necessarily about the state of that middle school math. There's some more digging I think we need to do there in terms of what we need to do with that next. And Ms. Wise, yes. Yeah, and I would just thank you for that, Taylor. I would just like you to know that districts were able to make that decision of whether to administer the seventh or the eighth grade uh, state test to their students. So. There could be other districts who are showing up in this state average with seventh grade students who were taking the accelerated courses. Our students took the eighth grade test and their students took the seventh grade test. So that's, we wanna be able to parse that out for you a little more so that we can really uh, compare like to like. Um, are you done? Mr. I'll, I'll just share with two, two last things here. Um, as far as the original timeline that we set for when results are gonna be able to release, just our two next steps that I know of is June 16th is the window where we're finalizing with DOE all of our school rosters for school grades for all the official reports that come out. And then our tentative goal is by that next June 20th board meeting to be able to share the updated data for our kindergarten through second grade students as well as our Dibbles data as well. And welcome feedback from um, board through the superintendent around uh, additional direction on that as well. Um, I was at, I see one light on, so I'm a, Dr. Rockwell has a question, I think. So my question goes back to that seventh grade math. Um, is, I know there are pros and cons to both options, because if you wanna see if your seventh grade accelerated students are truly ready to go into algebra one and eighth grade, you probably want them, wanna see if they got those eighth grade standards, but in terms of like school grades, comparisons with the state, do we plan to stay with having them take the eighth grade test or? So that's a great question and I want you to know that there are a lot of pro and cons to making that decision as to which test is most appropriate and we decided to offer the assessment that most closely matched what was taught so that we could know what kind of job we did with our students on those benchmarks. Um, in terms of school grade, if you're proficient on the eighth grade test and you're a seventh grader, we're going to get that proficiency percentage. Okay. My, my other question is, um, so we could look at like proficiency percentages and that'll give us better, perhaps better information. But when we talk about the, the state average, do we have any information on how many districts chose to take the eighth grade test? Um, I'm just, I'm just, my concern right now is that the students who aren't taking that accelerated seventh grade math in either sixth or seventh grade are, we're, they're clearly struggling more in seventh grade math. And I know we have the same situation with algebra one, the students who did not take it in middle school struggle on the EOC in high school. And so, you know, 
we clearly have some work to do there, but I'm wondering how it compares with the state. So that's a great question, and I'm not sure. I do know that Mr. Frazier has done work with his colleagues through the State Math Supervisors Association to have a sense of what districts are doing, but the, the bigger picture and what you're noticing is what we see with students who don't take Algebra One until they get to high school. And I think um, while that continues to be an area to target for growth, one of the things that we're doing, I think, that's gonna make a difference in the same way that I think UFLY Foundations is making a difference with literacy is we're offering advanced math courses beginning in third grade to prepare students to be in that advanced math track sooner, um, to be more prepared to do that, but it does, uh, we are hoping, we do not have as many math implementation specialists and support as we do currently for ELA, and we are um, looking to expand on that, and I think even what we're doing in ESY this year for the first time by offering um, math and science as part of all secondary ESY programs is something that can help us. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with starting advanced math tracks in third grade, but that's kind of the opposite of what UFLY Foundations does because UFLY Foundations is making sure every child has solid phonemic awareness and phonics instruction that is science of reading based. And so if we were to transfer that over to math, we would be looking at doing some number sense interventions in K-1-2. So, I mean, it's different. <laughs> Yes, agreed. I'll, I'll just share two thoughts that I, I thought of as you were sharing that, Dr. Wackwell, is one, I know of a couple of opportunities coming up. We have a state assessment meeting come up, and I know there's also um, FATA, which is the, um, it's basically the group of like testing coordinators in Florida. I'm curious to know if that's a noble question of like, do we have a list somewhere that shows by district what choices they ended up making? Um, it also makes me think that a lens that we can maybe look through with middle school math is looking by course, particularly those eighth grade students who are transitioning into ninth grade, um, having a really clear indication of, of what we're doing with curriculum in those eighth grade courses, not just when they get to high school and are starting to take algebra or um, algebra 1A for the first time. Okay. Are you, could you turn your light off, um, Dr. Rockwell and Ms. Abbott? My question, um, we just got this data today, so I haven't gone all the way through it, but I do have a couple of questions about uh, what we're gonna do differently with our subgroup of black and African-American students because um, even at schools that perform well, uh, that subgroup does not, and so it's all across the district. I'm particularly concerned with SI schools about what we're going to do differently next year because while there were some gains at one particular school where I have more in-depth data, um, we can't continue to make those gains every year by the time the kids get out of, uh, they won't even be on grade level by the time they get through fifth grade. Um, at this school in particular, SI school in particular, in third grade, 14 of the 72 kids were proficient. And so I guess my question is, how many were, were those kids retained that weren't proficient or were they moved on? Because if they were moved on to fourth grade, they're gonna get fourth grade curriculum with some intervention, I'm assuming, but they're not ready for fourth grade skills. That's a huge number of, of children that were just moving from grade to grade to grade. At that same school and, and on the star testing end of year, 62% of the kindergartners were not on grade level. 76% of the second graders and 71% of the first graders. So, you know, we can look at all of these things and sing, sing praises for a lot of these schools that are doing a really, really good job. But I'm going back again to these SI schools who are still have kids who are not getting the instruction they need. A lot of these kids do not have teachers in their classroom, which I have been saying since November certified teachers. And so I wanna know what we're gonna do different starting next year so that when we look at these numbers again, we aren't gonna see that 14 of 72 kids are proficient in reading and are moving on to the next grade level. And so there has to be something different. SI principals are in there. 
Uh, we've got UFLY that's in its third year, I believe. And so I think that that is helpful, but we can't keep doing the same thing. Something has to be done differently for these kids to make the gains they need to be successful with their learning. Thank you. Um, I, I have the same question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to Mr. Andrew to see if he and his team have uh, in their planning for going forward for next year. Um, I, I've talked with Mr. Shellnut about the, the job fair. I'm not sure if they're fully hired at all the schools. I think they've had really good success. I heard Ms. Jones say of the success that they've had with the job fairs. Um, so I guess before, Dr. McNeil, Ms. Ms. Abbott, would you turn your light off, please? And I saw Dr. Um, Mr. Andrew, before you go, I'm going to let Dr. McNeely go because there may be something about that you may can Thank address you, in there as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Since you and colleague Abbott are talking about what's going to be done differently, especially if you're waiting for um, the d supervisor director of um, personnel to come up forward. But I have a concern with the many, many teachers that were non-renewed. Um, I called around to find out from personnel some of the teachers that will be picked back up or have they been supported? Did, were they supported during the year? I could not get answers. And I'm disappointed because with the shortage nationally, nationwide, just think where we are here in Alachua County. So if we have long-term subs and there is a management problem with a regular teacher who cannot handle classroom management, my question is, where is the support? I'd like to see the support given by the administrators at that school. I could not get that kind of information. In fact, I probably shouldn't have re even received what was the problem why some people were non-renewed. But as a teacher, a first-year teacher especially, they are going to need that extra support. And in some cases, I think we are lacking. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. You know the TSAs support first-year teachers. The teachers on special assignment and mid-year, they were, after the first of the year, some of those were moved back in the classroom. So the teachers that they were supporting, they weren't able to do that because they were teaching the reading block at the schools where there were vacancies. So that did shift in some instances. I don't know if in the case where you are, but I do know that there were TSAs that were moved from coaching and supporting teachers to um, teaching in a classroom. So. Yes, ma'am, I remember that, but I'm not going to, those instructional cultures were so needed, and I know why we did move them, but we still have in our, each of our schools, especially elementary, that principal, that AP, that um, behavior resource teacher, you've got all types of people, and you've got district staff. If there is a problem, with classroom management, my goodness, call in and get that help from the curriculum department of behavior or student services. I just cannot see all of the teachers that we have non-renewed and they will be picked up in some other district. And then we'll go back to um, long-term subs in our SI schools. All right, uh, Mr. Andrew, we will give you, I see Mr. Shelnut is standing up, but I'm going to um, go ahead to Mr. Andrew and you can. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so as some of you know, we changed some of our hiring with our job fairs. Since our job fair, uh, we've hired at our SI schools 40 instructional positions. This was as of June 2nd at 10 a.m. I, I received this report. Um, so. We're working hard to do that. As far as uh, beginning teacher support, we have changed the model for next year, uh, and that'll be pushing into schools. So we'll be going back to the model that we used to have where support's provided at the school level by colleagues. So if I teach second grade, it'd probably be with a colleague from my second grade team supporting me 
um, if they have the clin ed training and what have you to provide that support. So uh, that's part of the summer work and training that we have ongoing. So we're, we're pushing that model back into the schools for all levels. That includes the high school and middle school as well, so the secondary level. But those numbers may have changed. I also want to say it was earlier this year when I saw non-renewals and we were um, lower than we have been historically when it comes to our non-renewals. So that's the information I, I have off the top of my head. And Mr. Shelnut, you could expound on, on those numbers if that's accurate. Uh, yes, thank you, Superintendent Andrew. That is accurate. It was, uh, I think, the smallest that anyone in my department can remember. In fact, I don't want to speak for Ms. Ward, but she and I even had conversations about that, about the numbers. There were some teachers that were able to come back when the state changed some of the certification requirements, and there have been some additional teachers who have been brought back as they finished other certification requirements to make a um, uh, contract non-renewal, um, certainly within the collective bargaining agreement and within the framework of the elect collective bargaining agreement. Uh, as a previous principal, I can tell you that the type of support that is provided to really all teachers, but especially our beginning teachers, consists of both school-based and district-based. So district-based can be mentor coaches and others. It was already mentioned, sometimes TSAs and different individuals were going. As a former principal, I, my assistant principals, would regularly be in classrooms. I agree with Mr. Uh, uh, Andrew that a lot of times there would be department chairs, next door neighbors, other more veteran teachers who would also be working and supporting. So it is a very collaborative effort. Um, but there can be some reasons and concerns ultimately why administrators make the decision to um, non-renew an annual contract teacher's um, position. And obviously those individuals are allowed to apply. Uh, we've had individuals who do get picked up uh, and that process is, is really on, ongoing. So I, I, I'm happy to speak with you, ma'am, after the meeting or in the morning or whatever you prefer if there were specific questions. I know you said you were trying to get some information from uh, my department. I, I'm happy to speak with you and try to gather any information you or any of the board members or Mr. Andrew um, require. Mr. Shellnut, yes, I, I thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Um, would love to speak with you probably in the morning while traveling to uh, Hillsborough County. Yes, but um, as a former principal, 14 years as a former principal, we know what beginning teachers need consistently, not one day a week or whatever, and I know we have marvelous administrators, and I know their plates are full, but when we are in a shortage and we pick up a teacher without calling any names, we needed a teacher after three other teachers were placed in this position, and then this fourth teacher was hired. We needed that teacher so badly in November, but we throw up our hands come June. I understand what you're saying, and we will talk. Yes, ma'am. Um, Dr. Rockwell, um, Mr. Sheldon, I don't, I'm not sure who Dr. Rockwell's question is for. Oh, okay, all right, go ahead. So um, we've discussed SI schools and the test results for our black students. Um, what hasn't been mentioned are the test results for our students with disabilities, and these are consistently lower at every school than even our black students. And we are failing our students with disabilities, and we need to take a really hard look next year at what we are doing in our tier two and tier three academic instruction for these students, um, at whether they are um, staffed correctly so that they're getting the amount of services and the amount of funding that they should be getting um, because we quite frankly have a huge problem here and I don't hear that talked about. I hear the achievement gap between our black and our white students discussed regularly, but not the achievement gap between our students with disabilities and our students without disabilities. 
Ms. Certain, if I may, um, and Dr. Ruckwell, I think to your point, I actually got feedback from um, a, a colleague about this recently, and, and something that it, it occurred to me as we're looking at this, when we're talking about the students with disabilities, those are the students who are taking FAST. I want us in the future, I think, to grow to include all of our assessments that we give, including the FSAA, including access points, including those other things and having goals and targets and have that be a part of our progress monitoring place as well. Yeah, um, I also know that we have had issues with getting accommodations for our students with disabilities, that it wasn't until PM3 that paper tests were available um, and that there are new restrictions on who can get a paper-based test. So I also have some concerns about testing accommodations. And I'm, I'm more than happy. I, I can share two things I know with you right now. One, the paper-based accommodations was a Department of Education thing that we had no control over, and when we were advocating very loudly for that as well. Um, the I'm, my voice is a little, so I'm a little bit over. Can you say that the last? There was a second part you said that I know I had, I had an answer for. It was about what so was the other that part? That the paper-based assessments weren't available for PM1 and PM2. Is that correct? That was correct, and as, as so part we, of the rollout from yeah, DOE, so yes. we don't have great. It's hard to measure growth when our students didn't have their accommodations, and I realize that isn't our isn't our fault. But I do know that we put in a process to try to meet Board of Education guidelines around the paper based testing, and I know every district has put in a different process. So I just want to make sure that our process is really making sure that as many students get the paper-based assessments as truly need them. Yes, and, and we worked closely with our ESE team this spring, um, and, and I remember the part I was gonna say, it was about, so DOE is essentially cracking down on preference for paper-based testing, so many kids' accommodations simply state that they have a preference for paper-based comment, like they, they rolled out and gave us a criteria that we worked with our ESC team on to turn into a guideline and template for our schools to use around ensuring that kids got the appropriate accommodations and had that um, noted in their IEPs as well. So there was more language on that, and I'm happy to share that with you and the board, the, both the language we got from DOE and the template and the tool that we worked with our ESC team on to equip schools with. Anyone, um, uh, Ms. McGraw? Yeah, um, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanna go back uh, to Mr. Shellnut. Um, one of the things Dr. McNeely mentioned, uh, of course, we want uh, certified teachers, but I also look at long-term subs. Is there any reason when we have long-term subs and they're gonna be with us that entire year, can they attend those new teacher orientations? Because if they're gonna be, and the reason I say that is because my daughter was a long-term sub, but we also had a long-term sub that did turn into a certified teacher who was already certified, but was finally given the opportunity to teach. But my daughter was a long-term sub and did a, mar uh, did a marvelous job. I'm not just saying that because she's my daughter, but she did a great job at Gaines for high school, but she said, Mom, why couldn't I be a part of the new member or new teacher orientation to get some of the same information as far as training, which would help with student outcome as well? Yes, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Board Member McGraw. I I'm certainly happy to speak with the professional development department and the director in that department to see what additional options. Um, obviously, historically, we're not trying, we, we're waiting to ho hopefully hire certified teachers right. for all positions, so we don't typically have long-term subs hired until much, much closer towards the beginning of the school year. Um, but I'm happy, I, I don't want to overstep any bounds, but I'm happy to speak with uh, the Director of uh, Professional Development and say is that a, an additional process to add those individuals in because I know everything with the beginning teacher program uh, does go through that specific office, ma'am. You I'll, just know I'll, it may turn into something. We want people yes, to become certified, but if they're going to be with us, let's train them as they're before the children. Yes, ma'am. And I'll also say that there are a lot of administrators and teachers who are working as well as district uh, uh, off, uh, individuals who are working with long-term subs and in many cases they are actively studying and taking those certification exams and we have had some individuals who do become certified during the year uh, which is a, a great process as well. And any public input? Any citizen input from the phones? Are they for this item here? 
Okay, so they'll have to wait then, okay? All right, then, if they're not for the ABC. We're going to go on and move to our action items, and we're, as I said at the beginning, we moved um, the change order. Ah, uh, this this been so long? Yes. We don't consent, yes. I keep, I don't, I'm, I'm like giddy up horse. <laughs> Madam Chair, the superintendent recommends that the school board approve the consent agenda as described in items two through 15. So moved. Second. A motion by Dr. Rockwell, second by Ms. McGraw to, for the consent agenda items as presented. Is there any discussion, any public input before I come back to the board? Any public input? Okay, uh, Ms. Abbott. Um, I just had a question. I had a question about uh, the design fees for Buholtz and I was just wondering what's going to be done to the entry. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, good evening, uh, board chair, board members, and Superintendent Andrew. That is a safety and security project oh, okay. for creating a Sally Port entryway. Okay. Thank you. Um, anyone else have any questions? I have a couple on the um, title grants that I have, but before I go, thank you. Ms. Abbott, do you have anything else? I had one more thing. Um, the Sierras uh, under the bids and renewals, I'm just wondering exactly what that is. Is that sign language? Was it, did that have to do with the contract that follows? Okay. And I was just wondering why it went up $120,000. I, I, I can okay. share with you. Black has left, but I called and asked about that. Um, that dates back to March. The rates, because we had more children and folks that needed accommodations for sign language, and we exceeded the PO amount. And so from March, we were over budget. So from March until August is what that increase covers. And I, just so you know, I asked Ms. Black if it would probably be more economical for us to hire on, try to hire staff to do interpretation, interpreting instead of having it all contracted out. And she says that they are exploring an option of trying to um, consolidate some job descriptions to increase the pay so that it would be financially appealing to people to work for the district versus a contractor because we're spending so much with the contractor. They were like 70 five dollars an hour and she got them down to 55 or something along that line so okay um i i had a couple questions on the title grants i guess I, I, and the first one was already a answered for me Ms. wise told me they've already been submitted because of the um because of the date was yesterday so um and the others i sent some questions to her i'm just going to let them go um at that since the the apps have already gone so so is there any, any other phone calls you have for anything on the consent agenda? Nothing? Okay. Any other board discussion or questions? If seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Motion passes 5-0. All right. Ms. Wynn is at the lectern. Good evening. I'm Suzanne Wynn. I'm the Director of Planning and Construction and Facilities. I'm here to represent action change order number six for project SBAC AT, I'm sorry, A1904, the Westwood Middle School Redesign and Redevelopment. Our previous five change orders were for owner direct purchase. We had a cumulative tax savings of $406,660.34, just as an FYI. This change order adds $1,127,406.73 to the contract, revising the contract total to $26,273,330.15. This amount represents an increase in cost for the removal of one abandoned fuel ta oil tank discovered during excavation work and all contaminated soil surrounding and associated with this tank and a second tank that was removed in 1985. These tanks contained heating oil, petroleum product. The recommended action is the superintendent recommends the school board of 
the School Board of Alachua County approve additive change order number six in the amount of $1,127,406.73, revising the contract total to $26,273,330.15. This change order adds 56 consecutive calendar days to the contract time. The new substantial completion date is July 3rd of 2024. Is there a motion? Second. A motion by Ms. Abbott, second by Dr. Rockwell. Any um, public input? Any board discussion? So um, I was hoping that we had um, a remediation insurance coverage for it, but it doesn't appear that we do, huh? That was the determination of of the insurance carrier, yeah. Okay. We just received that information this past week. Okay. All right, then, so is there, if there's no other discussion, we're ready to vote. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes 5-0. Thank you, gentlemen. I know it was a long time getting there, but. Thank you. All right, then. Let's see it on the road again. All right, so let me, let me go back up here now to our other items that we have here, our employee cases. Yes, ma'am. Uh, chair, certain members of the board, uh, employee case 0171-44, the superintendent recommends that the board terminate the employee effective June 7th, 2023. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Motion by Dr. McNeely, second by Ms. McGraw. Any discussion? Any public input? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, motion passes 5-0. The second case we were told was pulled, so we go to the to, to third case. Correct. Uh, thank you, Board Chair. Employee case 0271-25. The superintendent recommends that the board suspend the employee with pay for a period not to exceed 90, day, 90 calendar days, excuse me, such suspension to continue thereafter without pay pending termination proceedings. So moved. Second. Motion by Ms. McGraw, second by Dr. Rockwell. Any discussion? Any public input? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shelnut. That's it for those. Um, we have our item four, the reading plan. Ms. Thank Yes, thank you, Chair Certain Board Members and Superintendent Andrew. Um, we have for you this evening the initial draft of our 23-24 Comprehensive Evidence-Based Reading Plan. Um, the Superintendent recommends uh, approving our plan um, in order, if it's approved uh, before June 15th, funding can begin being released on July 1. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Motion by Dr. McNeely, second by Ms. McGraw. Um, any questions? I saw Ms. McGraw's light first. I'll go with you then, Ms. Ms. Dr. Rockwell. Go ahead. I have a couple of questions, um, Madam Chair. Um, in B, where it talks about the school literacy uh, leadership teams, um, do we have evidence that they have been uh, meeting, uh, developed a leadership team at the schools? Are they doing that now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. We can collect and provide that, yes. Okay. We have a district uh, reading leadership team, too, as well. Okay. And the other thing is it, um, the leadership, uh, the literacy leadership team, is that only for raised schools or that's going to be for all schools? I believe that's all schools, but I might have to double check that. I believe every school has a literacy leadership team. Uh, and then on the second, on number three, um, three, where it talks about describe what has been revised to improve literary outcomes. Um, I really want to make sure because we know we got to make change. This was a whole harm this year. But what is the action plan to support our principals? I mean, we want to make sure we have enough oversight. We want to make sure we have enough guidance for this. And so who's going to ensure this monitoring, monitoring would take place and who would they report back to? We got to make sure, I think that gives to what Dr. McNeely was saying um, earlier about making sure we're supporting because we know this year uh, we're going to have to make progress. I just want to make sure what is the action plan to support our principals who then would, you know, meet with their leadership team 
uh, and then you know, it trickles on down to the teachers. Yes, ma'am, that's a great question. Um, Mr. Berry and um, our director of the professional development department, Ms. Mm -hmm. Petty Farrar, will be meeting with Lastinger next week um, to talk about how they can help support us with administrator um, professional development, specifically around literacy, and then our executive directors for elementary and curriculum are the immediate supervisors of our principals, so they would be tasked with um, ensuring that the reading plans are implemented with fidelity, and Mr. Barry and I share the responsibility of supervising and supporting our assistant principals together with their principals, and so we'll be helping with that. And I noticed also on number four, when it talks about these obs observations will be stored, Google Drive, and you know, principals will be you know, conducting weekly classrooms. I just wanna make sure we're not one and done. Again, we gotta make sure this is happening. When are they going to be trained? Uh, I, I see on this, this reading tool, this reading plan implementation, all of that, I just wanna make sure because I'm really concerned about this year has gotta be a year of achievement. Yes, ma'am, and, and we know well that the um, frequency and quality of feedback is what makes the biggest difference, and so that's why we'll be collecting that data and storing it for review. Okay. And the, uh, the other question, the last question I have is, when we talk about, I know some of the teachers, and then how they're going to ensure that the Illuminate platform, we're talking about Illuminate align with best practices, because I know teachers have been expressing uh, illuminate to make sure they can pass the PM1 and the two and the three because they don't align when you're pulling certain assessments. It's what teachers are, have shared when it comes to using illuminate. I'm um, not sure, Anderson. Are you talking about some of the assessments in Illuminate or actually right, using right. the software? So right now, we have a new test. We're, we're dealing with PM the FAST. And so, teachers are saying that Illuminate is there, but are those assessments aligned with, it does Illuminate align with our best standards right. as far as they're now taking, you know, because we want them to be, when they're practicing, taking tests, That's right. I mean, taking questions and answering like that are going to help them pass the PM yes. one, two, and three. So that's, I mean, very obviously and basically the point of those um, assessments that are housed in Illuminate, as well as the assessments that are for frequent progress monitoring that are associated with our core adopted materials. Um, we do get feedback from teachers about a, a bad question or if they don't feel like the assessment is effectively measuring the rigor of the standard, and we take that feedback and work on it. Um, you know, any time that we're creating our own assessments, we're certainly open to feedback on that, but we just met about that this week, or no, it was last week with the elementary curriculum group, and we had elementary principals, we had members from the curriculum team as well as from the assessment department to get that feedback and identify what areas we need to improve moving forward, specifically with Illuminate and those CAPM uh, common assessments. Okay, and one final uh, comment. Now, I know with the literacy coaches, I was looking at must possess the following, a bachelor's degree in effective or highly effective rating for the most recently available evaluations, okay? But I do know uh, that we have had, we've hired a couple of people, and I just wanna put this out here, that got needs improvement and unsatisfactory with their VAM scores. And so I'm concerned, we have to make sure if we're gonna say this, I wanna make sure this is happening because the next year, we have, this year coming up for 23, 24, we cannot have people who are not going to make sure academic progress is coming to these teachers. And if their VAM scores are low, that, that's not effective and that should not be happening. And that's my comment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Rockwell, would you turn your light off, Ms. McGraw, for me, please? Um, so one of my questions on page two of the reading plan, um, it's got $265,000 um, for tutoring programs, but no FTE. So that's not paying for tutors. What is that paying for? So this is um, the stipend that teachers, so our classroom teachers are paid $28 an hour to tutor after school. Um, and we have a Google Drive for every 
school that has listed every teacher, every student they see, the frequency, the duration, pre-tests and post-tests, and we have that information. So that 265, just slightly over $265,000 is money that will be set aside to do um, that intensive literacy tutoring next year. And that's that's not the beyond the bell tutoring? or No, ma'am. Okay, so this is specifically are, literacy, face to face. Students, students are specifically nominated to participate in that based on need, identified by their Dibble score or I station. Okay, um, my other question is um, when when we're looking at um, the tier three interventions, I'm seeing a lot of duplication of tier two interventions. Is that because it's are they like tier two at one grade level and tier three at another? Um, I was just curious about that. That could be the case depending on the grade level and the intervention. It also could be the same intervention but either one to one or a much smaller group as you move to tier three. Okay. Okay, Ms. Abbott, you recognize. Uh, my question is on page three and I just need some clarification on the K through two fast testing. Is that normed against just against kids in our district, or is that normed as th third through ten against kids in the state? You know, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I think our our data can be um, compared statewide. Okay. That's uh, when Mr. Gilfillan was saying that the platform that houses our K2 data isn't as user friendly. It's taking us a little longer to get all of that. I still think that we're able to make those comparisons. Okay, yeah, because my understanding was it was just we, for that age group, we were just norming against the district. And so my question was gonna be, if that is the case, um, do we know what other districts, what, what their norm would be? You know, we're, you're, we're saying 40% and above is, 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 you know, at grade level, so, but. So I hope that at the next board meeting, I or uh, Mr. Berry and Ms. Dell are um, in Orlando at the state reading um, conference this week. And I imagine they're gonna come back knowing a lot more about this. They're there, um, it's running at the same time as a BS. I Summer Institute. So I think at the next board meeting, a lot of these questions we will be able to answer with more clarity. All right, thank you, Ms. Wise. Um, Ms. Abbott, if you turn your light off. I, I, I don't have any more questions. I ask all my questions before the meeting, so. Um, is there any public input, Mr. Foote? Okay, no one's in the auditorium, so we ready to vote. All in favor of us of adopting this reading plan here? Vote aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Wise. Um, number six, student progression. Yes, okay, thank you again. Um, we have uh, brought to you for um, review the first reading of the student progression plan amendments for 23-24. Um, the superintendent recommends that the board adopt the amendments um, to policy 5410 student progression and the amendments in the actual 2324 student progression plan as presented for advertising to schedule the public hearing on July 18th. So moved. Second. A motion by Dr. Rockwell, second by um, Dr. McNeely. Is there any discussion, uh, Dr. Rockwell? Um, I, have, I have several questions. Um, on page one, where we've changed to all students are expected to earn a high school diploma. Um, when we assign a student to alternate assessments, we've automatically not done that. So I'm, I don't know if that's... We can certainly revert back to the encouraged. I mean, I just, yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. Yes, ma'am. Um, my next question is on page, um, well, this isn't a question. I just noted that on page 19, there's an extra space before the insertion, it looks like, possibly. Um, Sorry, could you tell me where the extra space is? It may not be. It may just be the justified side. Oh. So 
so I'm not going to worry about that. Um, on page 21, item three, mm -hmm. we have the steam magnet, but we didn't include the A when defining it. So science, technology, engineering, math. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, and then on page 47, give you a second to get there, it's a ways. We have um, students need to have eight credits in electives. Um, do we need to specify the half credit in financial literacy that's in the revised 5460 policy that we just had the public yes. hearing on? Mm -hmm. That's correct. And I think that's all of it. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. And Ms. Wise, on page, well, 21, I guess, actually not you, this is for Mr. Andrew. The fine arts magnet at Rollins, I thought during budget committee meeting, we were discussing eliminating that due to low enrollment and student performance and the extra units that they had in, in for that. We scaled back the units that they were allocated. There are special units. Yeah. So that without those units, they still can have the magnet? No, we, we haven't brought that to the board on the magnet there, but we scaled back in budget committee as we discussed the number of units allocated. And I think, Mrs. Wise, with the magnet there, would we have five or eight students that were attending there? As a magnet? Currently, Mr. Andrew, I'm sorry, I don't have the number of applications and acceptances for this year, but I can get that for you and the board. Yes, yes, Dr. McNeil. I guess I'm just trying to figure out how we scale back the units and how we're going to provide, because the, 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 they had like two or three extra units there just to do because of the, the electives, but... That's, I mean, I had the questions of my colleagues, some of the, the things that Dr. Rockwell, but that was my question I had there. I had a question earlier when Mrs. Gallagher um, was speaking as far as the um, mill money. Because of Rollins, um, yes, they have been involved in international research, but when we pull down a magnet program, and I know those students really need core academics, but let's face it, they also need some additional things other than just reading ELA and math and science. These are some of our children who are some of the neediest, if that's a correct grammar word, in our district. Right now, it has been scaled back and we have a music teacher in supposedly magnet program and dance. Please do not call it a continua, continuation of magnet if that's the only thing that we are going to offer for those students. I know how much we are pushing for academics, but let's face it when you have been involved in reading and math all day long and you have nothing else to look forward to, and I know my colleagues would be saying, that's the problem. But let's face it, elementary school, and because I was in F school and we continued with our fine arts program, it needs to be revisited and looked at. I would not want us to be calling, well, the superintendent just said it's scaled back, but it's more than scaled back when you only have two teachers. One of the um, magnet teachers was placed at another school in the district, so now we're down to two. And, Thank you, Madam. And Madam Chair, if I may, on that, um, so yes, we'll get with Kim Neal on the name change. And we did scale back, and we've, we've uh, listened to the Bureau of School Improvement. They've given us advice, too. It's so hard when they were running so many different specials to get the school scheduled and then to have the adequate instructional time. So 
you know, I think a lot of it, too, is related to actual performance, and I don't disagree with the impact that fine arts have, um, yet at the same time, part of the Bureau of School Improvement's recommendations to us were to look at how we have the school scheduled, and that it was making it additionally difficult to do that. Mm -hmm. I, they'll still have the specials, Dr. McNeely. Yes. They're not getting rid of the specials. They, they're still going to have that. You don't have to push your light back on. Come on. I see you. Go ahead. I hear you, Madam Chair. Yes, they will have their art and music. I don't... I, this is a conversation that I need to have with the superintendent, Ms. Neal, the principal, some of our colleagues up here, the children that we're talking about that are so low and, and struggling, they don't have the extras that supposedly were being offered in the magnet. I cannot speak, and if the state board says to close to it, then you don't have anything else that you can do. But I, I, I just, my heart breaks for the children that we serve at that school who will be now eliminated from the extra things. And scheduling is a problem, but if you schedule it right, Superintendent Andrew and others, it can be done. Electives are electives. And you don't have to do dance and music and architect and um, sculpturing every single day. I know that for a fact. 14 years of it. So, so help me. Help me. Yes, ma'am. I, I guess, what, what are you saying that they won't get? I don't get, I'm, like they're going to have, they just, they'll still have the specials like the other schools have. Are you saying... Tell me what they're going to be missing because the it's it's the same way that the parents who got up to talk about the Buholtz finance and entrepreneurship. I guess we don't have the parents coming in here or doing a rezoning issue to talk about the beauty of the program and what this offers these children. And when I say these children, I mean all of the children. I hear that we only had seven kids to apply for the magnet. However, I thought it was an all school magnet. I didn't know it was just for children who might be applying. I thought it was a full school magnet, something that we said we really needed in this district. So I know that the academic piece is suffering, but I also know what the teachers who were at that school and offering could benefit the children who we serve. They might not be reading at this point, but they may know how to do some research. They may know how to do some sculpturing, all kinds of things that will lead to um, better involvement. So if I went there, and, and, and as you said, Madam Chair, had the music and PE like the other schools, but now we are no longer doing the extra magnet. It's a, it's a dim, dim day, a dim day, especially if we are doing extended day as well as all of the other 90 minutes of instruction. That I'm, I think that's the problem, though. I don't think that the scheduling, like the reading block, well, I'm not sure. I looked at their schedule, and I'll share it with you because I did yeah. ask for it. Sure. I wanted to see it, and I was trying to figure out, like, when when, they, when are they getting read, and when are they getting the math? And I mean, it, it's, and for the extended period of time, that's what I was concerned about. But I'm, You're the fact right. of the matter is, um, or the, for me, the way I'm looking at it is that we had seven, eight students over the years. I think out of zone, I'm assuming, I'm going to make the assumption that those seven or eight students that we're saying are in the magnet are from out of zone from Rollins. They're choosing to go there. 
right? That's correct. There were three acceptances so far this year. Ms. Neal messaged me. But I think I saw Mrs. Wise head nod when I said it's a school-wide magnet. School-wide. So it's, it's school-wide school programming right. that isn't happening to magnetize right now. So every student in the school currently or what, last school year and the previous school years was getting enhanced elective offerings meaning there would be an area of specialization as I understand it and I don't want to speak for, for that school and, and maybe Miss Jones knows it better than I do but there's an area of specialization that did make it different than the other elementary schools but um, I haven't looked at the schedule as closely this year um, and moving forward I think without those extra elective units that yes. Mr. Andrew referenced their schedule would be more like a traditional elementary school, but perhaps the way they offer those uh, electives or specials to the students is different, allowing them to spend more time in the area they're most interested in. We can, we can, we can chat and we can talk and we, I see. We have to do it in this session here because it's something we vote on, Dr. Maitland. All right. And it's a financial issue. And honestly, when we look at the student performance there, if we don't get the students up where they're reading proficiently and doing math proficiently, the school going to be closed. So ain't going to be no arts magnet. I mean, that's, that's like, I hate to say it, but be that blunt, Dr. McNeely. And then the, the, the amount of money. And, and I hate to sound like, I mean, God, I mean, I hate it to sound like I'm saying, like, it's not worth it. Because I, I think every dollar that we spend on arts education, music education, it is worth it. Like, Hawthorne don't have, don't, don't even have. Oh, I was going right? there next. I, yeah, so I'm, I, got, I got an issue with that, too. They don't have art, right? But our students there, and it's consistently that they have, they, they have been more performing. And so, but, and they're getting but, extra units. Ms. Certain, have we looked at how many teachers we did not have at that school who were certified, who were not long-term subs, no counsel, no guidance. I mean, there are a lot of factors that impacted that school, and we need to be honest and face it. I agree with you. This year and previous years, they have had their challenges with staffing. I, 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 and Madam Chair, I just want to chime in. Uh, I agree in here with Dr. McNeely is saying, because to me, overall, um, every school needs good programming. Every school is unique. Every school is different. And different. I think it also stems, I'm just going to be honest, it stems from leadership. It stems from having high expectations for all of your children. Uh, go back to some things Ms. Abbott has been saying. I think it can be done. I think we need to look at it because um, where it is, that's why all of our schools have to look at. I'm just looking at everything as a whole for this upcoming year. But I think you got to have, we, we just need to figure out with, new, with leadership how we're going to work it out, give him a chance to try to work it out, him and his, his team. Because I think if you make it that way, it's going to make it more difficult. You want to try to give incentives to help kids to want to improve and want to do better. Um, and the staff that really cares, that is there, is really concerned about that. Because I know I've gotten several phone calls about taking away, but also how are we advertising this magnet? How are we making sure parents know about it? But also I think it stems from leadership and the overall leadership has got to look at the overall environment of, uh, of, of uh, that particular school. Those are my thoughts. I agree with school leadership, school culture, and all of that. But out, even outside of this year, we've had some challenges. I, I'm not sure what the, what the solution is, but I do know that when we look at overall the staffing and the resources that were put into Rollins, and it is because they had the, the magnet, it's off the allocation. It's not part of the allocation manual. So those additional units that they were getting there and entering into um, where we are with um, our funding, that is something we're going to have to look at. And, and the mill now is being shared. It's, we don't keep it all in, right? So I think that we have to, it's one of those things we have to look at. So I don't, I don't, I'm not privy to what the DOE has shared with, with Mr. Andrew. I'm not privy to that. But I do know in, in the, the budget committee meeting, it was just looked at, you know, the 
the draw there and the focus that they need to make, and it's, it's beyond this one year. You know, Dr. McNeely, I've complained to you about Rollins, how it has been the, the status of that school for four years. My first, whole first four years, I've complained to you about where it is and the things I've had issues there. So I don't know, but that's how, that was my question. I saw it here, and it was this progression guide differed from what had been discussed and what's been moved forward with in the budget committee meeting. And so that was why I had the question. So I don't know where that puts us with this. This is first reading. It's not concrete today, but this is, right? First reading. Sorry, first yes. And I, I do, I think I misspoke, Dr. Rockwell, that um, even our students who are taking the Florida alternative assessment are being tested at the access points of the Florida standards and they are earning a regular diploma. So they so we don't have any students who are getting like a certificate of attendance or anything like that. That's if no. the gra graduation requirements. Not uh, not unless they don't meet the graduation requirements, but there is a pathway for students who take the alternate assessment to earn a regular diploma. Dr. McNeely, your light is still on. Are we good? You're good? Okay. All right. All right. We ready to vote. We've had some good discussion. We have any citizen input, sir? All right. Then um, all in favor of this moving the student progression plan forward, um, vote aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank you. All right. Ms. Wynn, why do you... Oh, I'm sorry, we did that one already. Okay, um, Madam Chair, we're to item seven, the social media representation agreement. Um, the board is, has before it a recommendation to sign an attorney-client engagement agreement with uh, many of the lawyers who represented the school district recently um, as part of the um, dozens of school districts around the country who sued Juul for the vaping litigation. And we recently brought to the board, uh, I think in the last couple months, a settlement out of that that's going to be paid out over the next several years. Um, this is a similar lawsuit in regards to um, social media and the impacts on um, our youth and the impacts particularly on schools and having to deal with um, the, the problems of social media. Um, there are materials here for the board uh, from the attorneys who are proposing to bring this litigation or asking us to uh, sign up with them to have them represent us. Um, but the schools across the country have incurred expenses about dealing with bullying and harassment through social media uh, increased disciplinary measures, um, dealing with uh, student mental health issues, um, that there is now more evidence um, coming forth that is generated by social media use, um, such as anxiety, depression, um, self-harm, uh, and so forth. So uh, if the board is so inclined, uh, the proposition before it, uh, would they like to retain these attorneys, many of whom worked on the vaping litigation in representing the district, um, to explore and uh, potentially bring litigation against social media companies uh, for similar harms that have come onto our campuses. Is there a motion? Second. Motion by Mrs. McGraw, second by Dr. Rockwell. Any discussion? When I looked at it, I looked to see what it costs us. It's like it's no cost unless you recover. It sounded like the personal injury thing, but so, <laughs> so we just jump on the jump on the bandwagon. If they get some money, we get some too, huh? It, it's very similar to the arrangement with the jewel litigation. Okay. So are you all in favor of us moving forward with this as part of this class action, I guess, of type some type of um, litigation for social media? But aye. aye, aye. Any opposed? We are now, um, we tabled the rezoning. We are now at citizen input. Yep. Two? Two. No, we. Okay. All right. 
All right, we'll receive our first citizen. Caller, please state your name. You have three minutes with the board. Hi, my name is Talissa Barsha. Um, I was calling to comment on Ms. Gallagher about the one mill in Rawlings being a fine arts of the school. Um, but I guess y'all are already talking about um, that because, frankly, like the culinary teacher, he, all he did was talk about his chickens and his chickens laying eggs. That is not culinary. And I've been trying to talk to y'all about that forever, but I guess y'all are already on top of that. Miss K. Abbott, thank you so much for bringing up the point about how kids, are they being passed along or are they not ready or whatever. My daughter, she barely passed along on the test line, but she passed on average with her school. Like where my son, like he was top of the school, top of the county, top of the state on his PM3. Um, but my daughter, she was barely passing. The school gave her a book um, to be ready for the fifth grade, um, to prepare her for the fifth grade. That was awesome um, for an SI school to do that. I've never had a school do that for any of my kids. So hopefully she will be ready um, because she does get accommodations. She does have special needs. So she is an ESC student um, in regular classes. Um, so that's awesome. Also her testing accommodations, she's supposed to get voice to text. I just found out at this board meeting that she could have gotten accommodations. Um, so she didn't get voice to text, but I hope y'all have a great evening and a lovely night. And those are some points to think about. Um, but thank you, Ms. K. Abbott, for just bringing up those testing scores. You are doing an amazing job. All of you are doing an amazing job working together. Um, I love how heated it gets, but calm it gets. Keep it up. I love the passion. Thank you so much for being passionate about our kids. That is what we need. Heated but calm. Thank you all. That's, that's the last citizen input. Okay. All right. So we're at um, board member and superintendent requests. Or any before we go, we have the student case item that's gonna be, we'll clear the well, we don't have to clear the room, it's just us. <laughs> um, okay, I don't have any requests. Um, anyone have anything for yes, yes ma'am, Dr. McNeely? Thank you so much, Madam Chair. I, I guess the question would go to Mrs. Dr. Edwards. It has to do with advancement via in the individual determination. Why, uh, why did that? program get pulled, how, how we fought for that. I know it started over at Gainesville High School under, I think, Mr. Shelnut, but I, I just want to know when you pulled it, because I was hoping that it would even get to the elementary level, because advancement via individual determination is a school academic support program that prepares students for success and ensure students are college or career ready. And I wanted to see it at the elementary level, but it seems as if it's gone. Yes, ma'am, thank you. So uh, that program, AVID, which we've had in our district, um, was a decision that was made under the former superintendent. Um, we looked together collectively um, at the executive level at the actual program and what we were providing at our various schools. So um, Abbott was offered at some but not all of our schools. It was moving by progression from grade level to grade level, but it did require additional funding and allocations in order to have supports for our Abbott classes. Um, when we look at the program itself, one of the things that we found was that Abbott was not being used with fidelity across our schools. When we had Dr. Uh, Beckett here with us serving um, in the capacity 
of the equity um, uh, teacher specialists. Um, she was able to look at each of the programs and to pull in information. And one thing that we noted that in the entire period for which we had Abbott and Alachua County Public Schools, none of our schools had ever met the standards um, that allowed for them to get a certain rating within Abbott. We had never reached that um, kind of like star merit status, which means that we hadn't been meeting the standards that are set forth by Abbott within our schools. We met with the school principals as it related to what was being offered in schools. And one of the things that we also realized is that we were paying um, a, a lot of fun. We paid a lot of money to fund teachers going to the summer preparation program. But then teachers were transitioning not just out of the schools that had Abbott, but sometimes out of the district. So we were um, preparing people to provide a program. And then when the people left, then it left us in a place where we weren't able to have all the supports. Myself and Dr. Beckett had an opportunity to meet with the representative from AVID, um, at which time we talked to her about what does AVID offer in terms of best practices. AVID does a really, really fantastic job of packaging best practices, but they are educational best practices. Um, and so that means that they should be um, provided by all teachers who come out of school preparation programs. And so um, there were some specific questions asked of the representative, whether school districts were permitted to offer um, that same information. Would there be an issue if we created our own? Um, and the answer to that question was districts certainly could do that. Um, if it was done, however, we could not use any of the terminology that was branded through the AVID program. That is where the development of the core came forth in Alachua County Public Schools last year, which is our college and career um, opportunities with rigor and engagement have come forth. Um, the intention there was that our staff and our school district would pre help to prepare all teachers district-wide, not just at some schools, but all schools and all classes and all grade levels, to help our students to focus on being college and career ready, not just in some, um, some class periods. Um, I, I don't think that any of our school principals, teachers who were using the program, um, parents would say that there's anything wrong with Abbott. I think that it was definitely supported um, by our instructional leaders within the buildings, but it was also extremely costly. Um, when we came in, I think last year, um, the first bill that I received as Chief of Equity, Inclusion, and Community Engagement was in the tune of $32,000. Um, it did not, it covered a portion of the schools. We still had several point twos that we were offering through the district to support AVID as well. And we also um, were looking at schools um, having funding to send teachers. And then when we went back to look at what was happening at the schools, we realized that, say for instance, if you were in a high school and you had an AVID program there and you had it in ninth grade, by the time you perpetuate through the AVID program and you reach 12th grade, a lot of the kids who would have started and they went through actually wouldn't have an opportunity to actually experience the AVID program. So by the time a school would be fully vested with the AVID program, you would have had four years to pass by where many kids never had that opportunity. And even then, it would not be in every class. So when we transitioned away from AVID, we were not transitioning away from the expectation of high rigor or college and career going mindset, but the intention was that we would do it for all students district wide and not for some students at some schools. Dr. Edwards, I thank you for your lengthy explanation. Your first word did it, the fidelity of the program. And when you don't have that, it's not going to work. And so as far as students, I could go back and forth with you, which we will not do with time elements tonight. But when you say <laughs> that the fidelity was the problem, then I might look over at the pink shirt that Mr. Shellnut is wearing, because he was the administrator at the time, and we worked hard to get that program in place. Also, with the monitoring and everything, every program is going to have to have monitoring. And if we didn't have it this year, 
you see where we are now? And I've heard that word fidelity over and over. So I hope we understand the definition of it and we'll get moving with it. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am, agreed. I also wanna make sure that we also highlight the other word, which was finance. We, we have to make sure that we can, I mean, financially, there is a hardship in being able to continually pay for that program and provide what was necessary um, at all of the schools because in that AVID program, as we step up and we move forward with each year, we are to, we're supposed to be adding onto the program each year. Yes, but budgetarily, we didn't necessarily have the finances to be able to add to the program. So that was part of what the thinking was. But I agree with you wholeheartedly, Dr. McNeely. That's why we were looking to see how are we doing with AVID. Um, principals really appreciated the program and teachers. I would never argue that. I don't have any issues with AVID whatsoever. But um, we did have to look at what we could do differently. And I know funding is a, a, a word that we have to look at in every single thing that we do, the cost. But it's even costlier when we don't have students who are ready and prepared for career readiness or college. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. McNeely. Um, so we are at we're going to adjourn our meeting, our regular business meeting, and we'll go into our closed session for the student case that we have. So the meeting is now adjourned for that purpose.